Greetings and welcome to the Morning Star Report. Our program today is called Oppenheimer, the atomic gangster, the development of the atomic bomb, the hydrogen bomb, and the menace that it poses to all mankind. I am here with my guest, my co-host, co-producer, Barbara Honiger. Uh, you know her very well by now. We've been on this program and several other programs together. Uh, we work on projects together. This is a co-production to bring to your attention the real nature of the man who was instrumental in developing the atomic bomb. I call him the atomic gangster, J. Robert Oppenheimer. I'm sorry that um, we haven't been able to get Barbara's camera to work, so you will not be able to see her during this broadcast. Folks, you know, those who follow the Morning Star Report, eight days ago, I did a program on July 16th, 2023, discussing that anniversary of the detonation of first atom bomb at the Trinity site in New Mexico. And I pointed out then what a terrible catastrophe that was. It was not good for mankind. It was not necessary to win the war because the fact is that Japan had already agreed to surrender and were asking for negotiations for a peace settlement. But in that war, for the first time in the history of war, the United States and the Allies demanded unconditional surrender, so there was going to be no negotiations. And I think that they did that out of a great desire to use the atom bomb in war to prove its power, its efficacy, and uh, also to scare the rest of the world, in particular the Soviet Union. There were many reasons, but I think those were the main reasons, geopolitical reasons. It was not really necessary militarily to utilize such a devastating weapon. The consequences of which uh, were not known. A lot of people talk about it as a war crime. It was not a fully conscious war crime. I'm showing here a photograph to open this program. You're looking at the face of the man I call the atomic gangster, J. Robert Oppenheimer. I think this photograph really captures the real man, his self-image, what he wanted people to think of him. And that's why I call him atomic gangster. A man that was totally dedicated to a science that denied the existence of God or a spiritual world, only to find himself confronted with a reality that involved both two years later in 1947. And we're going to tell you about that a little bit later in the program. Right now, I would like to show you, you're going to hear what it was like, the first nuclear tests the first nuclear tests that occurred in the 1940s. Folks, that's the beginning of a documentary that you can see on YouTube. I've used this as the opening. Of course, the audience who's listening cannot see the video, and perhaps they were not able to hear.
Following World War II, devices were created that so far surpassed the power of the ones used in the war, it's almost hard to comprehend. From the Castle Bravo test, whose explosive power was more than double what scientists expected, more than a few decades ago, the first large-scale test of a thermonuclear device took place. The codename given was Ivy Mike, and it produced a blast of 10.4 megatons of TNT. In total, 9,350 members of the military and 2,300 civilians were involved in this one test. Work was finally completed on October 30th at 5 p.m., and within an hour, everybody involved was evacuated to a safe distance. The mushroom cloud created rose to a height of 56,000 feet in less than 90 seconds. A minute later, and it had reached over 108,000 feet. The blast was so powerful, it completely erased the island on which it occurred from the map, as before and after pictures show. But this was only the beginning for the United States. And as you're about to see, Many larger tests occurred in the coming years. A partial nuclear test ban treaty was signed to hopefully limit incidents like these from happening ever again. Operation Hardtack 1 was a series of 35 nuclear tests conducted by the United States that included more nuclear detonations than the sum of all previous nuclear explosions in the Pacific Ocean. This operation, led by Joint Task Force 7, involved approximately 19,100 personnel, including members of the U.S. military, civilian employees, affiliates of the Department of Defense, and the Atomic Energy Commission. The tests, which took place between April 28 and August 18, 1958, became some of the most fascinating nuclear tests ever recorded on camera. On May 16th, a test known as Wahoo took place. While it's not on this list for being one of the biggest, we included it because it gives you a new and high-definition look at the scale of a nuclear blast, and because it's one that occurred underwater. Within seven seconds of detonation, the dome spray had reached a height of over 800 feet. A target ship stationed about three and a half miles away was directly hit by the shockwave, which shook it violently. The test was considered a success and paved the way for further underwater tests to take place in the following months. But what we were watching was the detonation of several nuclear weapons, the Trinity explosion, the Bikini bomb in the Pacific, which turned the Pacific Ocean into a boiling cauldron. We saw a fleet of U.S. Navy ships, of cruisers, destroyers, freighters, tankers, all wiped out in an instant. First, there was the, the blast. Then there was the boiling sea and a rising mushroom cloud. 
This was followed by a tidal wave, which swamped the ships. The documentary is about how Britain and the United States both exposed thousands of soldiers to nuclear devices at close range. There's a famous movie that I recommend to everyone. It's called The Atomic Cafe. And it shows how they asked soldiers in the early 1950s out in the West, in Utah, Nevada, where these nuclear tests were being conducted. They, drew, they dug trenches and they were told to hunker down in the trenches. They asked some of them if they were brave enough to stand up and take the nuclear blast right in the face. And immediately after the blast, as, as the ionized air was still being strung with particles, radioactive particles falling, leaving tracers in the air, they, they marched them right through the blast area to see how quickly a U.S. Army unit could occupy an area that had been devastated by a nuclear weapon. It's a very famous statement made by the atomic gangster, J. Robert Oppenheimer, at the time of his epiphany, when he saw the success of the Trinity test, he chose instinctively, subconsciously, to identify himself with Shiva, the destroyer. And he relates how he famous, famously said to himself, Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. That's quite profound. His alter ego was revealed. Right now, we're going to listen to him tell his story of that event. And then I will turn to my co-host, Barbara Honiger, to elucidate. I we knew the world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. I'm sure that he's the only one who thought that, frankly speaking. Now I would like to introduce my friend, Barbara Honiger, who was a White House policy analyst and a special assistant to the president for domestic policy, as well as director of the Attorney General's Law Review at the Department of Justice during the Ronald Reagan administration. Well, I'm going to let Barbara introduce herself. So Barbara Honiger and I have worked together closely now for over a year. And uh, one of the things that we produced was the special on Ronald Reagan called Remembering the Gipper. So I'm now going to ask Barbara to introduce herself because uh, I'm not getting cooperation from electronic devices here. Maybe Oppenheimer is not happy with my epithets and my description of him as the atomic gangster. So Barbara Honiger, welcome to the program. Hi, Robert. Hi, Robert. Hi. Can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you perfectly. Okay, I want to make sure there's not a, um, you know, a, a doubling up. Uh, is there any echo? No, there's no echo. The sound. Okay, sounds good. Good, good, good. Well, um, I'm not sure how much of an introduction I need. I think you you got in some of the critical details 
Um, I've held high-level positions in the U.S. government. Um, I'm not sure how much of this is relevant, um, but uh, I was also, I think you mentioned, um, I was the project director of the Attorney General's Law Review at the Department of Justice in the Reagan administration. Yes. And probably most importantly, though, um, for 16 years, I was an affairs journalist at the Naval Postgraduate School which is, uh, it, it's called by the Department of Defense itself as the premier science, technology, and national security affairs graduate research university of the U.S. Department of Defense. So I was a senior military affairs journalist there for 16 years, um, 11 of those as a GS 12 and 13, which is a pretty high-ranking position. And you can imagine uh, in the federal service, and you can imagine that that um, my credibility was uh, the reason for them paying me big bucks to do my research and writing and publication in DOD publications. So um, that's probably the most relevant, but also relevant. Is the, is let's, not, let's not leave out your degree in consciousness. Yeah, I'll get. I'll, I'm getting to that. I'm going to do my government work first. Okay. Um, so, so we had the Reagan White House and Justice Department, and then senior military affairs journalist for the Department of Defense for 16 years. Uh, and then, uh, in addition, I'm also uh, an author and an independent investigator and historian like yourself. My book, October Surprise, was published in 1989, on May 12, 1989. And uh, it is on the deep story behind the Iran side of Iran-Contra and has been uh, confirmed by formerly classified documents and deathbed confessions of multiple co-conspirators of the attempt to delay the release of the hostages in exchange for arms in a treasonous deal by George H.W. Bush Sr. and William Casey, who became Reagan's first CIA director with the Khomeini regime before the election in October 1980. And my work on that has just recently, a front page article in the New York Times on March 19th, just received additional phenomenal validation from another whistleblower in a near deathbed confession front page of the New York Times. So, you know, I'm an investigative um, historian like you, a citizen historian, and that's probably the most important. But finally, um, ever since 9-11, I have been a leader, re leading researcher, activist, and publicist on the, the, the real facts about 9-11. Yes, and I yes. am... I am the uh, board chairman of the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry, uh, and we are the one organization, uh, actually two now organizations, that have filed very serious um, grand jury petitions um, to try to get um, a the, the truth about the World Trade Center attacks, the anthrax attacks, and the Pentagon attacks uh, before a special criminal grand jury in both New York, uh, Manhattan, and Washington, D.C. So that's my background. Yes. So, you, do you have a question? <laughs> uh, yes, the question is, <clears throat> where would you like to begin on this uh, expose of what I call the criminality of the atomic scientists? And it's it's a long saga. So, where do you where would you like to begin? I have my ideas, but uh, okay, let's okay. let's start with your idea. Where what's the most All important? Right to know about the development of the atomic bomb and Oppenheimer's role there with Einstein. Yeah. Okay, very good. Well, first we should say that I've seen, on the first day that it came out this past Friday, I have seen the movie Oppenheimer, and you have not yet, but you will. Um, so anyone who's seen Oppenheimer, um, I'm going to start by reminding you about the two critical uh, strategic plot moments. Obviously, the Trinity test uh, of the A-bomb at uh, Los Alamos. Uh, and, of course, Oppenheimer was in charge of that entire project at Los Alamos uh, in New Mexico. And, but most importantly, and most importantly, most importantly for this program, um, there, there are scenes in the movie, including the final critical two scenes, uh, that, that involve Oppenheimer talking with Albert Einstein. So what I'm going to do is to begin with 
Uh, the critical fact that you learn that is a shocking fact that is a through line, a thread throughout the movie Oppenheimer, which itself is based effectively upon the historical record. So it's, it's basically a docudrama, except it's, you know, a full-time Hollywood movie, dramatic movie. So one of the most, the most important fact that you learn in the movie Oppenheimer is shockingly, shockingly, that as they were developing uh, the A-bomb for the Trinity test at Los, Los Alamos, that according to the film, Edward Teller, who went on to be the father of the hydrogen of the A-bomb, that he was there with Oppenheimer and the other scientists, Hans Bender and others, that uh, the movie has Teller having made a calculation before the Trinity test, a calculation that, and he went to Oppenheimer with it, and he went to all the top scientists there, and he said, my calculations, and he gave him the calculations on a piece of paper, he said, my calculations mean that we cannot rule out when we are, if we successfully ignite the atom bomb, and remember it had never been done before, Trinity test was the first time ever on this planet, that he said, if it was a successful A-bomb test at Trinity, that we cannot rule out, based upon my calculations, that the detonation would not detonate the entire atmosphere of the planet, all of the hydrogen and all of the nitrogen, kill all life on Earth, including all life probably in the upper 20 feet of the oceans worldwide. Now, I want that to sink in for a minute. Because Oppenheimer and Teller and Hans Bender, the entire Manhattan Project, they went ahead anyway. And I'm here to tell you, and we're going to, uh, hopefully Robert will be able to play, um, the answer to a question that I raised with an important um, American history historian, Professor Peter Kuznick, who is the co-author uh, and co-producer with Oliver Stone of an important 12-part uh, historical video series called the, it's either called The Hidden History of the United States or The Secret History of the United States. And one of those episodes, I forget the number, but one of those episodes is on the Trinity test, the atom bomb, the hydrogen bomb, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And a few years back, I found out, I went to Stanford University my undergraduate and graduate work. And uh, I learned through my some, some kind of flyer I got from the Stanford Alumni Association here in the Monterey Peninsula of California where I live, I learned that, that Oliver Stone and his co-author and co-video series producer uh, on this very subject, Professor Peter Kuznick, I believe of American University in Washington, D.C., an American historian, uh, and uh, also, Daniel Ellsberg, we're going to speak together at Stanford in the evening, and of course, I went to it. And now I'm going to tell you the reason that I went and why I asked the question you're about to hear historian Peter Kuznick's answer to, which is mind-blowing. So I'm going to back up a little bit. And a few months before I learned that they were going to be speaking together at an event at Stanford University, I was uh, then the senior military Terry first journalist at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, here in Monterey, California. And there are many conferences put on there. And as the senior military first journalist, it was, it was my assignment almost always to cover these conferences for our DOD publications online and, and print uh, editions. So I went to this conference. And at this conference, which was on military history, there was a professor of the Navy School who mentioned during his presentation at the conference, this phenomenal fact that, um, now he said, he didn't say it was Edward Teller's calculation, I think he said it was Hans Bender's, but whosever calculation it was, what he revealed in the conference to gasps from the audience of academicians and military officer students, he revealed that the Manhattan Project physicists could not rule out by their calculations before the Trinity test 
that the detonation of the A-bomb wouldn't ignite the entire atmosphere in the upper part of the oceans and kill all life on Earth, including, of course, all humanity. And I couldn't believe my ears. So there was a Q&A at the end of his presentation, and I asked him to repeat that and give more information. So I already knew about that claim. So forward in time a little bit, and I learn about Oliver Stone, Professor Peter Kuznick, the American history historian, and Daniel Ellsberg being together at an event at Stanford, which I attended. So I'm now going to, um, I believe that Robert has, yes, Robert has on the screen. It's it's on the internet. I gave him the link over email uh, yesterday or today to play on this show. You're about to hear, um, hopefully, um, the answer to the question that I asked. I was sitting in the very front row because I knew Daniel Ellsberg and I wanted to interact with him before it started and, and I did. So then there were the presentations and then there was the Q's and A's and I was the second or third person to ask a question. I'm going to tell you my question because it's hard to hear in the audio of this video and then you're going to hear the answer by Professor Kuznick. I can actually I can actually read you the transcript of what he said afterwards. So my question was this because they hadn't mentioned this. Now, this was a presentation about the history of the development of the H of the A-bomb and the H-bomb and the Trinity test and the dropping of the bombs and the decision to do so on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the consequences of that. So um, in the Q's and A's, I put up my hand, I was called upon, and I asked this question. This is the gist of the question. I said, well, um, I'm the senior military affairs journalist at the Naval Postgraduate School. And at a conference there, uh, one of the professors of history, military history, mentioned the claim that one of the physicists, can't remember which one, um, in the Manhattan Project at Los Alamos, that his calculation, which he shared with Oppenheimer and the other physicists who in turn shared it all the way up the chain of command to President Truman himself, they could not rule out that the tr that the atomic explosion in the Trinity test would not kill all life on Earth by igniting the atmosphere, all of the hydrogen and all of the nitrogen uh, in the atmosphere, and also kill everything in the upper portion of the oceans worldwide, and that the decision was to go ahead anyway. That for whatever reason, if you can imagine the mentality of this, that it was more important for these people to have a, basically have a leg up on the Soviet Union in the future, uh, they were willing to kill all life on the planet. Okay, so including all, all of humanity, of course, including, them, including themselves. So I asked that question, and hopefully we're going to be able to hear with pretty good audio the, yes. um, the yes. answer uh, by Professor Kuznick, who is the co-author of the book and video series called the Hidden History of the United States, or The Secret History of the United States, co-author with Oliver Stone. So let's try to hear that. Okay. Here. Father, it takes credit for being the father of the H-bomb, says to Hans Bethe uh, that, you know, this, this is a trivial issue, the atomic bomb. Let's immediately start thinking about the super bomb. And the super bomb was the uh, hydrogen bomb. It's going to be a thousand times, thousand times more powerful. He wants to develop, start working on that immediately. The other members of the Manhattan Project had to calm him down to get him to work on the atomic bomb. The atomic bomb is the trigger that's used to detonate the hydrogen bomb. Uh, but he's already thinking about the super. And, and when they're out in Los Alamos, uh, when they're out in Berkeley, they, uh, they start doing these calculations and they realize there's a chance that they could set all the uh, nitrogen in the atmosphere, all the hydrogen in the seas on fire and bl blow up the world, basically. And so Oppenheimer rushes out to see Arthur Holly Compton, who's vacationing in Michigan. And he lays this out, and Compton says, stop the project so we can figure this out. He says, better to live in slavery to the Nazis than to bring down the final curtain on mankind. And one of the themes that Oliver and I are developing here is the idea that Truman and, uh, and others knew they were beginning a process in the most dangerous way that could ultimately lead to that. What I see is the big difference about the atomic bomb from the strategic bombing is the knowledge now we have finally have the power, developing the power, to end life on the planet. 
And Truman says that on April 13th, he gets briefed by Burns, flies up to Spartanburg, South Carolina. And Truman writes it in uh, his, uh, in his, diary, in his uh, memoir. He said, Burns told me that it's a weapon great enough to destroy the whole world. Bart gave me a document some years ago uh, after the April 25th briefing when Stimson and Groves briefed Truman. Uh, Truman writes or, uh, in Parade magazine, his, his daughter probably has some hand in this, uh, but he must have told her that they said that maybe even if we have this weapon, maybe we shouldn't use it because it can end the world, basically. And Truman says, after reading the document and after listening to them, I agree. We should consider that. Then on, then on July 25th, when he gets the briefing about Almogordo, he, he writes in his diary that this may be the fire destruction prophecy in the Euphrates Valley era after Noah and his fabulous ark. So Truman knew that. Truman had some, on some level, as did others involved in this. I'll be saying here, Oppenheimer said that within uh, three years, we'll likely have weapons between 10 megatons and 100 megatons. It means up to 7,000 times as powerful as the Hiroshima bomb. So they knew the, the, the road they were taking us on. And, then, and as Dan and I and others have been working about nuclear winter now and the implications of even a small nuclear war uh, between, or uh, Marty Hellman knows this stuff better than anybody, given the danger of these things. So, well, unfortunately, much of the public thinks that nuclear weapons are no longer a threat, that nuclear war is no longer possible. The worst thing you have to worry about is some terrorists getting a dirty bomb. So far from the truth, uh, which is why we bring this episode of all of them to as many audiences as we can. We want people to realize the danger and realize that fallible human beings have control of these weapons. These are not great states. These are not Albert Einstein's who have control of nuclear weapons around the world. It's the Harry Truman's of the world who, even though it's not necessary, could use them in these situations. Yeah, okay. So what you learn here is that Truman, initially when he was told about this calculation that, it, that the Trinity test might destroy all life on Earth and in the oceans, um, upper part of the oceans, that he initially agreed that they should not go ahead. But later, he decided to go ahead anyway, and that is... The, that is on Truman's shoulders. That is not on Oppenheimer's shoulders. That is on Truman's shoulders. And in the movie Oppenheimer, there is a scene not too far from the end where Truman literally says that to Oppenheimer in the Oval Office, where Oppenheimer is expressing guilt and shame and regret for having done what he did to make it possible to drop the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And Truman uh, looks him in the eye and moves his chair closer, and he says, do you think the Japanese people give a flying you-know-what as to who made the bomb? No, they care about who dropped the bomb, and that's me. And then he said goodbye and called him a crybaby and had him leave the Oval Office. That's a, that's a scene from the film, which is based more or less on the historical record. Um, so, so Truman went ahead. So... Uh, the other link I want to make that's very, very important, very important to the Oppenheimer movie is both at the beginning, close to the beginning of the film, and the next to the last scene, as well as the last scene directly related to it, is about an interaction at the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton University which was directed by Oppenheimer and where Einstein then was a fellow. Uh, uh, he was a physicist in residence there. And this scene is the two of them outside on the grass uh, by a pond. And at the beginning of the movie, you see them interacting in the distance, but you don't know what they're saying to each other. And then you see the whole movie, you see the Trinity test, you see that they went ahead anyway, even with Truman's blessing, finally, knowing that it, or, or believing that it could end all life on the planet. Uh, and then at the very end, you, the next to the last scene, you zero in on those two men, Oppenheimer and Einstein, standing by the pool there in New Jersey. And what are they talking about? They are talking about that calculation uh, that was made before the Trinity test. So, the very end of the movie, at the end of that scene, you then, you then imagine a fast-forward possible future. You know, thank God, hopefully not the actual future. But the final scene of the movie Oppenheimer is an imagined 
future of the planet seen from space, like out on a out in the space station or something like that, looking down at the planet when that actually happens when the atmosphere starts to completely ignite and starts moving around the planet. So this is a very important fact. People need to understand, you have to ask yourself, is, was this really, I don't think it was, was this really about, was the Trinity test and the A-bomb and the H-bomb and Nagasaki and Hiroshima, was all of that really about winning the war? Or was it about something much, much bigger? I think it was about something hugely bigger. I think that we cannot rule out the possibility that the Trinity test and what has happened since is for the explicit, was for the explicit purpose of being able to destroy all life on the planet. Not just have a nuclear war between two countries or something but to actually be able to develop the capability to destroy all life, including all human life on the planet. And that would be for what purpose? I believe that that purpose, the goal, could, could have been in the mind of Oppenheimer and the Jewish scientists who were basically in charge of this project, um, that their goal may well have been to bring back what they called the gods in the Old Testament, the Elohim. And that, the, and that is in fact what apparently happened right after Trinity, after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that's when the whole new historical uh, sequence of UAP, UFO sightings, craft, uh, alleged ET crashes, all of that happened in the wake of Trinity. Exactly so. This yes. is this is a hypothesis that many many of us hold that what they did at Trinity, Nagasaki, Hiroshima was actually open interdimensional portals on that, purpose on purpose to facilitate the re-entry into human affairs of these so-called gods, the yes. tyrannical gods of the Old Testament that invested them with tremendous power, tremendous influence. Most people have heard of Majestic 12, and we're going to get into the extraterrestrial component of the, this experimentation, what I call the Luciferic component. Robert, uh, it closes the circle. So many people are not aware that Oppenheimer and Einstein, those same two men in the final scene of the movie Oppenheimer, talking about this the shocking calculation and the fact that Truman and the whole Manhattan Project team went ahead with Trinity anyway. Um, in June of 1947, which of course was after that, um, in June of 1947, those very two individuals, Oppenheimer and Einstein, together wrote a memo to President, that would be Truman, would it? Or was it Eisenhower already? What year? Ni June 1947. That's, that was Truman. Mm -hmm. So they wrote this, and um, maybe uh, Robert can put up the first page of that on the screen because it's extremely important. It's online, and uh, one of us can read the, um, the uh, link so that you can read all five pages yourself. It's on the, on the Internet. But what's extremely important, given this hypothesis that Robert and I both take very seriously, the fourth paragraph on page one, and again, this is to Truman, right? And remember, you heard the answer to the question by, by the historian Professor Kuznick, in which he said, if you could hear it, uh, that at that Stanford University event, if you could hear it, he said towards the end of his answer to my question about this calculation, whether it was true, he said, oh yes, it's a lot worse than you think. And then he went into all of that. At the very end to the answer to my question, Professor Kuznick says that Truman, when he was told about what happened, that he said, or, or what might happen, he said, oh yes. And then he cited the Old Testament. He cited what the Jews 
and the Hebrews called the Pentateuch, which means the book of the five books. Okay, and that's the Old Testament of the Bible. So the fourth paragraph in the Oppenheimer-Einstein letter of June 1947 to President Truman, who had decided to go ahead anyway and do the Trinity test and drop the bombs, knowing that this might be the road to destroying all life on the planet, which I happen to believe was their goal to bring back the gods in their, in their belief system. The fourth paragraph says, international law should make a place for a new law. And by the way, the whole, the whole context of this letter is, well, it looks like there are extraterrestrial aliens here on the planet and in our atmosphere. Okay. So the fourth paragraph, International law should make a place for a new law dealing with these apparent aliens and, and extraterrestrial craft should make it should make a place for a new law on a different basis from current international law. And this might be called the law among planetary peoples, in other words, including ETs, following the guidelines found in the Pentateuch. Now what does that mean? It means following the guidelines of what the Jews, the Hebrews claim in the Old Testament of the Bible was their first covenant with the gods. And they don't say God, they say gods, the Elohim, that's plural, okay? So what they're proposing here, because the Christians believe that when Jesus came, this is their belief system, that that was the second covenant, the new covenant, right? That's why it's called the New Testament. Right. So these, these, this letter from Oppenheimer, and Einstein to Truman, President Truman, is proposing, hey, let us Hebrews be the ones to interact with these ETs to, to negotiate a third covenant with them on the guidelines of the first covenant in the Old Testament, in the Pentateuch. Okay? So, you know, it's extremely important for people to understand that not only President Truman, but the, but the scientists, especially the Jewish scientists, and I don't care if they're Jewish or not, but, but the only reason I mention that is that they have this belief system that's based on the Old Testament, on the Pentateuch, that these, these Manhattan Project scientists who did Trinity, who did the Adam and the H bombs, who did Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs, and President Truman who decided to drop it, they were all thinking in biblical messianic terms which is precisely the language that you're seeing today in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the papers in Jerusalem after the uh, Knesset, the parliament or Congress uh, in, in Israel, pushed through today the far right-wing uh, religious, basically theocratic law, uh, a change to the basic law, because Israel doesn't have a, a formal constitution. They call it the basic law. Uh, they pushed through a new law that would limit the power of the judiciary to prevent the theocratic, orthodox Jewish-based government, the theocratic elements of Netanyahu's coalition right-wing government, from doing exactly what they want to do to fulfill biblical prophecy from the Pentateuch. So people need to understand this. Yes, yes. yes. The most disturbing thing about this proposal of theirs is to, to return to the old ways of the Pentateuch in the worship of Yahweh, who was an angry, tyrannical God that demanded human sacrifice or animal sacrifice. I was speaking to my, my dear friend, uh, my friend, my student, Rabbi, and I pointed out to him some of the, the really terrible aspects of Yahweh. And he said to me, when I was a little boy in the synagogue, they always read this statement from Yahweh, and he said, I am an angry, wrathful God, and I love the smell of burning flesh. That's what Holocaust means. And then I said to him, if Yahweh loves the smell of burning flesh, it means he has a nose. And if he has a nose, he is not a spirit. I think that Yahweh was a reptilian extraterrestrial. I believe that Jesus Christ came to the earth and he overthrew that old, angry, tyrannical, wrathful God and supplanted it with a God of love that he always referred to as Abba. 
Nowhere in the New Testament have I ever seen Jesus utter the words Yahweh or Hashem. He Abba always, means Father, doesn't it? Heavenly Father, Abba. Oh. So there, he he actually overthrew the old tyrannical God and established a living and loving God. Now but I would like so, to. He did so for the believers in that religion. Unfortunately, of course, not for these people. Right. That's right. This is strictly for the Christians. So right now, with a, a few minutes left in the program, I would like to read the whole first page so people understand the context of what we are revealing. That Einstein and Oppenheimer made a secret deal with extraterrestrials. And this is where I say they betrayed the human race. I'm going to read you the first paragraph, then we're going to discuss some of it in the second hour. We're going to return to the subject and get to the last paragraphs. And then in the last segment of the second hour, I'm going to play for you what I promised yesterday. The rest of the interview with James Files, the man who shot President Kennedy, and Gordon Ferry, the CIA agent who reveals his role in the establishment of a global banking system that has taken over the world. And you will hear him say that the CIA turned into a global criminal organization, and that is the greatest threat to humanity today. This Fourth Reich, which emerged out of the paperclip Nazis taking over almost every aspect of government. So right now, let me read this letter, June 1947, from Albert Einstein and Robert Oppenheimer. It's called Relationships with Inhabitants of Celestial Bodies. Relationships with extraterrestrial men represent no basically new problem for the standpoint of international law, but this possibility of confronting intelligent beings that do not belong to the human race would bring up problems whose solution it is difficult to conceive. In principle, there is no difficulty in accepting the possibility of coming to an understanding with them and of establishing all kinds of relationships. The difficulty lies in trying to establish the principles on which these relationships should be based. In the first place, it would be necessary to establish communication with them through some language or other, and afterwards, as a first condition for all intelligence, that they should have a psychology similar to that of men. At any rate, international law should make place for a new law on a different basis, and it might be called law among planetary peoples, following the guidelines found in the Pentateuch. Obviously, the idea of revolutionizing international law to the point where it would be capable of, of coping with new situations would compel us to make a change in its structure, a change so basic that it would no longer be international order. That is to say, as it is conceived today, but something altogether different so that it could no longer bear the same name. If these intelligent beings were in possession of a more or less culture and a more or less perfect political organization, they would have an absolute right to be recognized as independent and sovereign peoples. We would have to come to an agreement with them to establish the legal regulations upon which future relationships should be based, and it would be necessary to accept many of their principles Finally, if they should reject all peaceful cooperation and become an imminent threat to the earth, we would have the right to legitimate defense, but only in so far as it would be necessary to annul this danger. Another possibility may exist that a species of Homo sapiens might have established themselves as an independent nation on another celestial body in our solar system, evolved culturally independently from ours. Obviously, this possibility depends on many circumstances whose conditions cannot yet be foreseen. However, we can make it a study of the basis on which such a thing might have occurred. Well, I will leave it there for the moment, and I will ask Barbara for a comment as we're coming to the end of the first, first hour. But you see, they were fully aware of the extraterrestrial presence here, and they were quite willing to make accommodations. And what resulted 
was a secret treaty that established a new world order. Well, yes, I do have a comment. Go ahead. And that is the, the quote from Yahweh, which was, you know, the, the Old Testament, the, the Hebrew Bible, the five books of the Old Testament, um, they talk about the gods, plural, as the Elohim, E-L-O-H-I-M. Yes. But they also talk about Yahweh as like, you know, the, the big kahuna, right? The right. Alpha, you know. um, but, but presumably, uh, in their belief system, Yahweh was just uh, one of the, uh, the Elohim. Um, but anyway, the quote that you read is very important. That Yahweh loves the smell of burning flesh and blood. Presumably... Not just human, uh, not just animal, but also human. Yes. Well, that's exactly what would happen if you ignited the atmosphere of the entire planet. That is exactly the entire planet would be filled with this horrendous odor, would it not? Absolutely. Okay, so people need to understand that the people who did Trinity and who are behind these nuclear weapons... They could have had the explicit goal of bringing back the Elohim, of bringing back Yahweh. And that's precisely what Netanyahu is trying to do with his theocratic-based, orthodox Jewish, rabbi-based coalition um, that, that has Israel, as of right now, today, with the vote in the Knesset, it has over 10,000 of Israeli military reservists, including their commandos, their special operations forces, including their pilots, including members of their army, saying that they will not report to duty if called because of this vote. They're calling for a general strike, and we're very close. The, the threat is that the Palestinians, seeing very clearly that this vote today means that there's no chance that they will have an independent Palestinian state, even where, even in the small bit of land that they now occupy in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, there's probably going to be a third in, intifada, a third uprising of the Palestinians and their backers in, in other uh, states in the Middle East and around the world. And I want to remind people that 9-11 happened, and Netanyahu was absolutely behind 9-11. 9-11 happened in the middle of the second uprising of the Palestinians, the second intifada. Yes. So we're in, a, we're in a very dangerous situation right now where the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the headline articles in the papers in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem and all around Israel and the Middle East right now today are saying that the, the head of the opposition which is the vast majority of the people of Israel, was quoted today in the New York Times or the Washington Post as saying that Israel no longer has a prime minister. We have someone who is in the thrall of the messianic, this is this Pentateuch, Old Testament ideology of Yahweh and the Elohim, that, that Netanyahu and his government are in the grips of this messianic insanity. Absolutely right. There are two messiahs in, in the Jewish tradition, Messiah ben Joseph and Messiah ben David. And they have crowned Netanyahu as the first of the two, the Messiah ben Yosef. And who, who, has, who has done so? Who? This is what they're referring to. That they no longer have a prime minister. They're saying that they have a messiah in oh, I see. Netanyahu. And for those of us who study the rabbinical traditions, we are aware of this uh, duality to the two concepts, the concept of the two messiahs. One as a precursor, it's like John the Baptist preceded Jesus with the coming of the new covenant, the new teaching. First came John the Baptist, then came Jesus. In their view, first comes Messiah ben Yosef, the Messiah of Joseph, and then Messiah ben David, the Messiah David. So they are preparing the ground, and let us not forget the mass death that has been unfolding across the earth, not only from the 
planned bioweapon, the COVID-19 virus, then the, the individual bioweapon of the mRNA vaccine, and the devastating war in Ukraine. These people are engaged in human sacrifice. That's right. The, the assassination of President Kennedy was a satanic ritual, mimicking the high holy days of triple sacrifice.